Well, um, after a very interesting and informative uh, first panel, it is my uh, pleasure to moderate and introduce you to the second front of the war in Ukraine. Uh, my name is Guillaume Lescongerias. Uh, I'm the head of research and studies at the IHDN, so the I Institute for, Defense, uh, for National Defense here uh, at the military school. And I'm indeed really pleased uh, to see you all uh, in the, for this second panel and this um, uh, day in general. So uh, prior um, giving the, the floor to uh, this uh, wonderful lineup of speakers, I'd like to uh, come back to why this front does matter. And I will start with um, something that uh, rang a bell couple of months ago. A couple of months ago, it was in early June, if I'm not wrong, at the inauguration of Eurosatory, you know, this, uh, one of these world's largest uh, weaponry industry uh, in trade fair, French President Macron uh, presented uh, what he was uh, actually asking the Ministry of, for the Armed Forces to do. This is to say a re-evaluation of the military budget planning law, what we call the LPM, what programmation militaire. He also announced on this very occasion an increase in the defense uh, and spending budget for the French armed forces. And in his speech, most uh, interestingly, he uh, particularly added that this reevaluation would also lead France into, and I quote, a war economy. My role is absolutely not to lecture you on what a war economy is, what it means in theory, or uh, if France is uh, currently in a, a war economy, because obviously it is not. Nevertheless, a quick definition of uh, what a war economy is still makes sense, and one assumes that war economy is the organization of a country's production capacity and distribution during a time of conflict. It is a moment where um, substantial adjustments uh, to accommodate defense production needs are uh, needed. And of course, it is a matter of strategic choices as governments must choose how to better allocate their country's resources very carefully in order to achieve uh, a military victory and, at the same moment, meeting vital domestic uh, consumer demands. So, three keywords, choices, adjustment, organization. Of course, when one focuses on Ukraine, Russia's uh, brutal invasion has debilitated debilitated, not destroyed, Ukraine's economy. Due also to the globalization process, the war has turned into a global economic disaster. We, you, all uh, feel the consequences. These consequences are felt everywhere, in Ukraine primarily, in Russia also, where sanction bites and are straining the Russian economy but also in the rest of the world. The economic challenges are threefold, increase of poverty, food shortages, cost of living crisis. So this panel will focus on several key issues. And for this, uh, let me introduce uh, our uh, special guests. Uh, on my uh, left hand side, Stéphane Audran, who is an historian and geopolitist uh, by trade, uh, holding a master's degree in both uh, disciplines. He's a former bank executive uh, responsible for operational, operational risk management. And since uh, 2013, excuse me, he has been an independent consultant. In this capacity, he advises large European banking institutions on controlling their risks in several sensitive sectors, arms trade, nuclear power, agriculture. A reserve officer in the French Navy, he also works on issues like arms control, fight against arms trafficking, and strategic foresight. At the center, Alexander Muzienko, 
He is the head of the Ukrainian NGO Center for the Military and Legal Studies. Alexandru is a military and political analyst uh, as well as a lawyer. So he has a broad uh, knowledge uh, and spectrum. He has also specialized in the following areas, national security and defense, strategic analysis, democratic standards of public administration. And uh, on the far uh, left, uh, Artem Shevelev is the former Deputy Fi Minister of Finances of Ukraine. Since 2016 and the nationalization of private bank, so which is one of the biggest Ukrainian bank, he sits at the supervisory board. He also represents Ukraine on the boards of directors of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, one of the biggest uh, institutional investors in Ukraine. In order to make this uh, panel uh, a bit more uh, different like the others, uh, we will start with first a presentation by Stefan for approximately 10 minutes on the grain uh, crisis, where uh, actually uh, Stefan will tackle three issues. The unfolding of the grain export crisis during the war in Ukraine, how this subject has to be uh, put into perspective with regards to the global issues on grain trade and economic resilience in general, and what does that mean also uh, for the free access to common maritime space. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, yes, I'm the guy with the boring slides and the PowerPoint, so uh, I, I hope I won't be too boring, so please try not to sleep too fast. Um, so uh, we talk about the, the Ukrainian grain crisis, uh, and to put this in perspective with the General Darius question this morning, is this war a lingering remnant of the past or a war of the future? I think that we can very much say that the war in Ukraine is not a global war, but is really a modern, global, uh, a modern war within globalization. And I uh, will discuss this uh, with uh, the matters of the grain crisis. So, um, uh, according to the figures of the International Grain Council uh, for the campaign 2022-2023, the world produced a staggering total of 2,269,000,000 tons of grains. And consumption was 2,271,000,000 tons of grain, meaning that for the seven consecutive year in a row, the world consumed a little more grain than it produced. And this is very worrisome because global stocks are falling and are now below 600 million tons four month of consumption of grains worldwide stored. So this is the context of the Ukrainian grain crisis, a world with no more you know, uh, overproduction uh, compared to the consumption of, of grain. And if this situation continues for 10 years or so, we will have depleted all the world stocks of grains, meaning that we will have a, a structural shortage of grain. So um, the grain that we are, we're talking about are uh, corn, wheat, rice, uh, barley, um, rye, uh, oats, but also the, the, the oil seeds, that uh, soya, soybeans, uh, the sunflower, obviously, in Ukraine, and, and rapeseed. And 82% um, of those grains are consumed in the countries that produce them, uh, meaning that the global grain market is uh, only about 18% of the grain produced. That is about 400 million tons of grains, of which Ukraine has had before the war a share of about 10, 12 persons. Um, so um, within this global market, um, Russia and Ukraine gained in the past 20 years uh, a considerable place, asserting themselves among the global pillars of the world trade. And this global market of grain, even if it's only 80 persons of the grain production, is crucial to ensure food stability of many countries which are structurally deficit on the agricultural level. So um, you see here some of the most vulnerable countries that needed to import grain for Russia and or Ukraine um, to, to basically sustain their populations be before the, the war. Um, what's interesting to, to note is that um, the, 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 the Ukrainian agriculture really picked up uh, some 20 years ago. Before that, 
You know that the Soviet, in the Soviet Union, uh, the agriculture was structurally deficit, uh, leading uh, Nikita Khrushchev to, to say that the Soviet Union sown its wet in Ukraine and harvested it in Canada. Uh, but it's changed a lot for Russia and for Ukraine. And uh, the value of uh, Ukrainian uh, agriculture basically uh, doubled in some 20 years, uh, growing up to 60 billion uh, US dollars of, uh, of um, current value before the war. And the effect of the Russian aggression goes far beyond the occupation of territories. Effectively, losses per year since the beginning of this war are about 25, 30 million billion dollars per year, meaning that the Russian aggression whipped out 20 years of growth in the Ukrainian agriculture. Um, so, um, um, agriculture in Ukraine had remarkable assets before the war, and of course, some of them are still here. Uh, first of all, a large surface, uh, 42 million hectares, that is roughly uh, ten uh, four times the, the surface that France is sowing in cereals each year. Uh, Ukraine obviously enjoyed a, f a fairly stable climate, uh, though the, the climate change is, is calling that into question. And Ukraine had good quality infrastructures, uh, especially along its rivers, and of course, many of that have been destroyed by Russia since the beginning of the war. Um, and finally, perhaps most important uh, with uh, cropland, uh, Ukraine had access, free access to the common maritime space through it, its coastline. And to put that into perspective, before the Russian aggression, 90% of all grain exports from Ukraine went through the sea. The thing is with grain is that it weighs a lot and there is nothing compared to maritime transport to, uh, to export grain on long distance. Uh, to give you a, a, a perspective for the, let's say the range of 40 million tons of grain that uh, Ukraine had to export, uh, a ship, a grain ship, uh, a grain hauler holds about 40,000 tons of grains that is 20 trains or 1,300 trucks, meaning that you don't have the choice if you want to export grain, you have to export it by sea. It's impossible to tackle the volumes and the, and the weight on roads or, or railways. And perhaps one of the most striking effects of the Russian aggressions was to immediately deprive Ukraine to its free access to the sea. And of course, um, there was no declared blockade, but it only took a few merchant ships sunk by Russia to um, uh, scare all the actors of the maritime transport and uh, they deserted Ukrainian waters. Here you, you see the traffic uh, along the, 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 um, the sea lanes of uh, the Black Sea and obviously uh, the, the most uh, important of them were from Odessa to uh, the Bosphorus, and they were, of course, uh, grain carriers, and, of course, all the carriers also uh, for the Ukrainian industry. And uh, the cost of the rising maritime insurance did the rest, and in very few days, uh, the Ukrainian waters were, were effectively empty of any traffic. Not because uh, Russia managed a long campaign at sea to sink uh, 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 maritime transport, but just because uh, the maritime players were scared because it was too, uh, too costly for them to enter the, the Black Sea. As early as, uh, as April, uh, Bloomberg reported that the cost of insurance to enter the Black Sea uh, was 10 percent the price of a ship, meaning that it was much more than the cost of chartering the ship, and of course no ship owner could stand it. Um, so, um, furthermore, and um, this is about the unfolding of the grain crisis, we must understand that when exporting grains, you are not exporting when you want, but you are exporting when you have to export, because uh, grain storage is roughly sized for a good harvest and a few leftovers from the previous year, meaning that you have to empty your, your stock before the harvest, otherwise the grain will be lost, because grain is sensitive to moisture, uh, is sensitive to rodents, to pollution, to insects. It will spoil, spoil it will uh, cause uh, explosions if there is not ventilated. So uh, you have to empty the stocks. And this was the trail as early as uh, March 2022. Fortunately, uh, in March 2022, most of the wet had been exported because wet is an early harvest. Uh, it's a winter crop, so uh, most, most uh, of the grain had been exported before the Russian invasion, but there were still substantial leftovers of uh, wet 
And uh, of course, there was a lot of corn mice uh, to export uh, before the harvest in, in, uh, in the late summer and, uh, and early autumn. And um, so th this was this task to move quickly more than 20 million tons of grain out of a country at war with its infrastructures targeted and no access to the sea. It was a staggering uh, uh, task to perform for, for Ukraine and for all the supporting uh, countries. Um, of course, faced with this shortage and faced with this blockade, the maritime transport, the private actors of the maritime transport demanded guarantees. So basically, Ukraine had two options to get this grain out, either the military option or negotiation. First option, military option, was out of reach in 2022. Um, so negotiation ended up succeeding. And, um, but first, we have to talk about the solidarity lanes. Um, uh, the solidarity lanes uh, set up by Europe, uh, they were um, really a huge effort to try to get out the, those 20 million tons by the road and by the rail, but as I told you, it is physically impossible to overhaul as much grain through road and through uh, railways and to waterways, uh, especially given the fact that the, the gauge of the railways is not the same between Ukraine and most European countries. So we uh, put up a lot of effort in the EU and we more than tripled our capacity to, uh, to overhaul grain through uh, the land routes. But at the end, it was only about a million tons per month, uh, short of the five fix of what was needed to, to get uh, the grain out of Ukraine. So in the end, it was the Turkish initiative that really uh, helped it uh, to, uh, to get the grain out here of uh, of Ukraine and uh, the the, the, Ukra uh, the 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 Turkish initiative was basically you know uh, two agreements uh, one between Russia and Turkey and uh, another one between uh, Ukraine and Turkey and uh, we talked uh, about this morning about how President Putin is good to exploit uh, the uh, the opportunities so President Erdogan shares a, a lot with it to exploit opportunity and this was a fantastic opportunity for for, for Turkey which is a huge uh, buyer of grains and transforming grains into flowers and so Turkey bought a lot of grain through this initiative and the idea of this initiative was that Turkey as a third party of confidence was here to guarantee that uh, no weapons would enter U Ukraine uh, through the, the, sea, uh, the sea lanes and only grain would be exported from Ukraine. And so this worked and, and really uh, the, the Turkish initiative um, really helped uh, to, uh, to get the, the, the grain out of Ukraine. And only fertilizer was allowed to enter Ukraine. Uh, by this uh, agreement, because yes, uh, the grain crisis is also a crisis of agricultural fertilizers, and in particular nitrogen fertilizers, crucial for maintaining high yields. And if you don't have fer fertilizers, the yield can drop for more than 40 to 30 uh, to 60 persons in one or two years. And their production is uh, very linked to natural gas, dangerous, very energy intensive, and Russia made a specialty of producing nitrogen fer fertilizers, and we let that happen because we don't want it any more of those industries in our land, you know, not in my backyard, better in the Russian backyard. But we paid the price, here's with a global crisis of fertilizers. Um, back to the grain crisis, so the great, the, the grain corridor was a really huge success and with the solidarity lanes, we managed to get out the grain of Ukraine uh, before the harvest, most of the grain was exported. And um, the thing is, it was um, even more difficult, not only because of the staggering task, but because also Russia was uh, targeting uh, the, the, the infrastructures of Ukraine and destroying grain depots. And uh, of course, my PowerPoint is a mess. So here, uh, obviously, grain terminals have strictly no military value, uh, but Russia targeted them nonetheless. Uh, so adding further uh, difficulties, lack of uh, trains, lack of trucks, etc. Um, so the effects of the war on the Russian aggression lasted much more than uh, the physical occupation of land. And uh, um, of course, as the time passes, we arrive to another campaign, you know, you're sowing wet in the autumn, you're sowing uh, corn in spring. And um, so the, the Ukrainian farmers, um, uh, in spite of all those uh, um, difficulties, they managed in the campaign 2022-2023 uh, to sow about the same quantity of wet as, as last year. And this is 
this is really reassuring for, for the time to, to go on, but at the expense of, of, uh, of corn and, uh, and sunflower production. And uh, at the start of 2023, Russia and the Ante opted to obtain sanctions relief in exchange of the renewal of the grain agreement in, on the Black Sea. But this time, and uh, Alexander will discuss the details, this time Ukraine had the means for the first option to restore access to the common maritime spaces, which is the military option. And I would like to stress that this is really one of Ukraine's undeniable successes this year. At the end of a long air and naval campaign led by drones, small units, coastal batteries, missiles delivered by the West, uh, we will discuss about all of that, the Russian fleet was driven from the waters of the Northwest Black Sea, and Ukraine uh, opened effectively a, a coastal corridor to uh, get the grain out along the coastal route uh, to the Romanian waters. Um, so this corridor is now protected and it's working. And besides, of course, Ukraine set up a, uh, an insurance mechanism to encourage private merchant ships to dock at its ports. And so um, back to, to the figures of, of this year's harvest, we know that, on a, broadly speaking, the Ukrainian harvest is down to about a third between 2021, which was a, an excellent year for the, for the harvest. So we see that in a world that is not producing enough grain to sustain itself, we see, we see here that the basic Kremlin propaganda that Ukrainian grain is not really needed and Russia can replace all the Ukrainian grain lost is basically a lie. Between, because the world is now over-consuming its stocks because of the Russian aggression. And for the time since the Ukrainians managed to reopen this corridor, uh, the world prices are uh, still below, meaning that the markets are trusting the Ukrainian, um, the Ukrainian way to, to tackle this. So, um, to conclude this intervention, uh, I return a few strong points. Um, first, um, the fragility of um, the world food system. Demand is on an upward trend, driven by the increase in population and the changing lifestyles, uh, meat consumption in Asia, and this fragility must be understood in a context of increasing climate change, uh, which means that even the old cereal countries like France will no longer have the certainty of regular harvest. So the Russian aggression is really an, an aggression against the globalization and the food security of the whole world. And by being responsible of this deterioration of the Ukrainian agricultural system, which goes far beyond the occupied territory, Russia is endangering the stability of prices of the whole world. And we also see in this crisis the extreme sensitivity of the maritime transport as a system and the fragility of effective access to common maritime spaces. If a naval war was to occur in another crucial maritime space, for example in Asia, Taiwan, the consequences would be quite disastrous. Which brings us here in France to two major questions. To what extent can we continue for our food security to rely only on a free market and an economy of flows without stocks? And on the other hand, how far are we prepared to go to defend free access to common maritime spaces on which we also crucially depend? And of course, we also saw the, the urgency, even in the midst of a war, to rebuild Ukraine's agriculture, not only for, for Ukraine itself, but for humanity's ability to feed itself and replenish accession stocks for the future. One final thought uh, since lunchtime is approaching and my time is running out. This is a view of my own field of cereals. I own a very small family farm in the middle of France, you know, family business, a few tons of grains a year. But I would just like to remind you one basic truth about agriculture. For your health and your good health, you may need to see a good doctor once or twice a year, but you need every day a farmer, French or Ukrainian, three times a day. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So, thank you for these uh, really uh, interesting uh, highlights. Um, I'd like now to move on to uh, Alexander, just uh, basically to uh, recall a bit. Um, uh, Stefan just uh, tackled. Uh, sorry, I move on to this. Okay. Um, Stefan just uh, managed to discuss also the military options about protecting uh, the, the corridors. Uh, he also highlighted how this is vital for just uh, our economy. Can you give us some highlights on how Ukraine tries uh, 
uh, and actually uh, reaches and, and uh, figures out to secure and protect this grain corridor and also uh, what kind of means and assets uh, have been used uh, in this domain. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I need to say that on the beginning of the full-scale invasion, during February, March, Russian ships, Russian naval ships, were nearby of the coastal of Odessa. That was very near. And of course, they was planning to use artillery, even ship artillery, to shoot on Odessa. And that's why we are talking about blockade that used to be. So Russians uh, tried to, to blockade uh, our seaports, the main ports in Odessa region. But during uh, the 2022, Ukraine launched few attacks against Russian naval ships. The first and the most well known, I think, uh, that was against uh, the naval ship Moskva. You heard about this probably. And Ukrainians used uh, our self-constructed, self-made missile Neptune, anti-ship missile. And from that time, uh, beginning our huge uh, war on the sea, which is continue uh, nowadays, during these days also. And this uh, war on the sea, probably one of the most successful type of cover campaign. Of course, with the battles uh, and the liberation of Kyiv, Kyiv region, Sumy, Chernigiv, and also Kharkiv, Kherson, of course. But uh, what we are doing right now uh, on the sea, that's very impressive. Because uh, look, from the days of Neptune, which we used, uh, which we used uh, now we are using different types of, then we uh, had uh, anti-ship missiles from our Western partners. And that was very helpful. We are very thankful for it. And then we uh, began to produce uh, to produce drones, sea drones. And now we are continue working on these projects. And we are having even you know competitions between our special services, between our intelligence and internal special services, who will shut down and who will attack more. Uh, Russian ships. That's a very good competition, I think. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and they wish and they wish good luck to them both. So uh, now what we can see is that Ukraine tried to provide different types of operation on the sea. And that means that we are using sea drones with a high level of the efficiency. That means that we are using also when we got uh, ships. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, missiles uh, such as. Uh, uh, Storm Shadow and Scalpy G. We are using them to attack Russian military objects on the occupied Crimea. And we also attacked uh, the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol. And also attacking two facilities in Kerch and in Sevastopol also <coughs> with, uh, with, with, with the Russian ships. And we are continuing to do this. So that's the first uh, point that missiles combined with the drones attack give us results. The second point is that um, our army do not afraid to provide very high risking operations, type of operations. For example, landing on the occupied Crimea, which uh, our special forces and military intelligence did. And uh, that's also very useful for us. And our special forces, they are working with the people and, uh, in the occupied Crimea. That's why we saw this picture, this video, which showed us uh, how missiles, uh, how a Storm Shadow uh, strike the headquarters of Russian Black Sea Fleet. So, uh, and uh, the next point, uh, that means that we are using also right now uh, that we are destroying Russian uh, facilities to provide intelligence near, uh, you know, Zmiyini Island, so they cannot see our activities. And that's why uh, we made more secure and defense uh, the, western, the northwestern part of the Black Sea. 
So, and Russians can't allow to move there to our Ukrainian uh, water. Uh, they cannot allow do this. And uh, they moved, they fled to the uh, Novorossiysk, and they trying to find right now some new places for these ships uh, in Abkhazia. So that's very important, and that example show how with not expensive price, protect and secure the grain corridor. Of course, we cannot speak that we are secured and we are protected totally right now. Of course not, because Russians have uh, military jets, they still have uh, opportunity to launch uh, caliber missiles and so on. But we are doing ourselves with the uh, help of our Western partners a lot. So that's how it works. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, you also, uh, in a way, uh, focus or, or place a light on, you know, this very imbrication on, on one part, on one hand, the military operations and also how this also is a possibility to protect uh, the vital uh, lines and, and the economy. Artem, just now to move on to you, we just talked about one particular angle uh, in this war, how to protect and defend one aspect of the economy, but uh, help us now to actually rise a bit uh, over this just a simple issue and come back to overall, what does that mean to reform a country while at war? What does that mean to be uh, shifting into a war economy? And also, I do believe you're a firm believer in the need for reforms. Can you update us a bit on what transforming the economy in general in a period of war, what does that mean? Uh, thank you, Guillaume. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure uh, we've got enough time to cover all the <laughs> topics. Uh, because well, in a couple of minutes then. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let me start by, by, by a more uh, generic statement. And uh, I think it's... Um, it's something that uh, Chancellor Scholz mentioned in the conference in Berlin last year uh, when asked about the, the, the type of recovery and the reconstruction in Ukraine and uh, uh, how to approach that. And he said uh, something along the lines that the best reconstruction is the, is the reconstruction that doesn't have to happen, which means basically you have to defend uh, Ukraine and you have to allow Ukraine to defend itself. because. The, 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 the soonest and the, and the furthest we can push away uh, Russian forces, uh, the less Ukrainian economy and our international partners will have to spend on, on, on rebuilding Ukrainian economy. It's, it's a very trivial statement, but it, it does make perfect sense. Um, along these lines, some numbers for you, which again, just to put things into perspective. Um, the uh, World Bank study, Rapid Damages and Needs Assessment, the RDNA2 that was done quite some time ago, put the number of uh, the reconstruction cost at uh, 411 billion euros. That's been close to a year ago now. Um, clearly, since then, the number went up. Uh, but still, uh, it's, it's a sizable, it seems like a sizable number. But this is a reconstruction that will be happening over a number of years. And on the other hand, you have G7 countries. And the combined size of the G7 GDPs last year was just over 47 trillion. Which means that if you take Ukrainian reconstruction over a course of 10 years, and if you take a very simplistic view of how much it would cost Western economies, it's substantial less than one-tenth of one percent per annum, which is barely a blip on the radar for any sizable economy. Um, however, we do see that we're still struggling on the economic front. Um, of course, Ukraine went through a dramatic uh, contraction of GDP of around 30% in 2022. Uh, this year, well, clearly because of the loss of territories, because of the loss of some heavy uh, industrial, indus heavily industrialized areas in uh, the uh, southeast. Um, this year, the GDP is projected to recover uh, 
by about 4.55%, which in a peaceful year would have been a decent economic growth. Unfortunately, we're talking about a recovery from an extremely low base. So that is merely a normalization. Um, it is absolutely essential that the economic recovery is geared up tremendously. And this has two, uh, no, I stand correct. This has three critical elements to that. One is the um, internal response. So what the country does itself to make sure that the economy keeps going. And this also touches upon the reform agenda that you mentioned, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, dwell on that in a second. The second component is, um, of course, the uh, international support. And although we have seen solid response uh, in 2022 and 2023 from the key partners, the prospects for 24 and beyond are much more challenging. Um, in uh, the, the, the three key components to that international support are the European Union, through the macrofinancial assistance package, is the IMF program, and it's the US bilateral support. Um, as uh, most of you probably have seen in the news, um, the stalemate in Congress uh, in the United States essentially blocks the allocation of the um, budget support from the United States for 2024, and it is a very sizable chunk of the uh, Ukrainian budgetary needs for the next year. Um, without certainty on that front, it is difficult to make projections. We, we, we are uh, comfortable that a solution will be found, but at the same time, it's all about predictability and it's about making long-term plans. And uh, I think it's clear that 2024 will be the year when budget support would still be in place, but this is also the year when the economy has to reorientate itself to more or less self-sustainability. <coughs> the third component, and I'll just mention briefly, is what we call it the BRD, the human capital resilience. Both the first, the first two components, our domestic efforts or international support, are only uh, meaningful if uh, there is a um, vital economy in the country. A vital economy implies having people to work and having people to pay taxes. Ukrainian refugees who unfortunately have had to uh, leave the country uh, since the beginning of the war, um, they found their new homes uh, mostly in Europe. Um, and on, of course, on the moral front, we hugely appreciate that, but it is um, unavoidable truth that it's critical that they return to Ukraine. They uh, have to build their livelihoods back home because this is the only way that Ukrainian economy can recover. Uh, for, that human, uh, for, that, for, the, for that to happen, you need to make sure that you have the kindergartens, the schools, the roads, the bridges, the workplaces, and all of that requires tremendous investment. Um, I'm running out of my time, so I will try and focus on the on the um, uh, on the, the reform the, front. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, the, the, very briefly, look, it's 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 an extremely difficult time to conduct reforms when the country is at war. Uh, on the other hand, it's it's a good old truth that never uh, let a good crisis go to waste. Um, is Ukraine making the best of the current war crisis? I, I'm not sure whether we are in the Chatham House role or not. I, I'm not convinced. I think we could have been doing more, but again, it's, it's, it's an unprecedented uh, level of stress that the economy and the government is going through. Um, I, I think it's also the, the role of our international partners. I um, am happy to be critical here. I do believe, and I'm seeing this from my EBRD quarters, we are not coordinating enough. Any tremendous reform effort now has to be supported by all the stakeholders, both inside of Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. And uh, I'm afraid that not all the capitals are kind of singing from the same song shit. So I think uh, 
we may talk about this later, but it's, 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 it's high time when we really step up the coordination and we do step up the financial support for the country. Thank you, uh, Artem. Uh, very interesting as you focus on uh, this uh, macroeconomic uh, vision. Let's now move back with you, Alexander, on uh, what's happening literally uh, on the ground uh, with regards to how to mobilize citizens, mobilize also the economy, uh, militarize also or weaponize, so to say, the economy. How is this uh, unfolding? How, what do you observe uh, from uh, your uh, own point of view? And uh, as a second uh, question, we observe a, a lot of spontaneous efforts to support the war effort in domains where the state has not been able, mm -hmm. has not been capable of uh, supporting, for instance, the, the troops. What does that mean in terms of organization? And is this, on the long run, sustainable? Because that also jumps on what just uh, Artem just said. Yes, thank you. As we know, the state system has a high level of bureaucracy. And, uh, of course, when we have a threat such as uh, uh, before our country, uh, because of the Russian uh, aggression, uh, people began to do something. Yes, everyone. Who, I don't know, some, someone uh, went to the mobilization, uh, someone uh, went uh, to economy front, as we called in Ukraine. Someone just donates money. Someone uh, doing something uh, somewhere on the information front. So we are united in this in Ukraine, and that's very interesting because you know that we have such as parallel structures in these processes. Because, uh, for example, uh, the most well-known example is drones. Yes, because that's why they are very important. We forgot about them, but then uh, we are thinking now that they are still very important and we need it. So people just organized, just donating and just buying these drones. But uh, what we are trying to do more is that a lot of uh, people from the, and businesses from IT, uh, from uh, AI, artificial intelligences, they are trying to connect and cooperate because uh, they saw in this example that in military, in defense industry, they will have, they can help to their country, to Ukraine, and also have a profit, because it's where it's uh, have a huge perspectives. So a lot of IT industry oriented oriented right now in Ukraine on the drone manufacturers, on the soft productions for military, uh, and so on. So that's the second uh, example, very important. The third example that uh, state uh, sources and trying to cooperate to make, make a communication with uh, a private sector, with the volunteers, and just to organize and coordinate this process, such as we have not bad example of the Ministry of Digital Transformation, which uh, created the project uh, Army of Drones with the uh, United 24 platform, when you can donate and then uh, we will buy, not only buy drones, but uh, then this project will transfer and move to further. And now that means that uh, it will support uh, producers of drones in Ukraine. So that's uh, the second example. Uh, the third, how it works, uh, uh, what I can see, the transformation uh, on the economical landscape in Ukraine, where uh, some companies, they can see that uh, Ukraine increased uh, in the GDP, in the national budget, uh, you know, more money will go for the uh, buying uh, different, uh, different types of products for the uh, defense industry. So they are trying to transfer, and they are trying to think what they can do for the army, for the sector of the national defense, because it's important they will help to Ukraine, and they will have uh, a profit, they will have money, they will, uh, they will give jobs, and they will pay in taxes. So that's also very important. And we have uh, 
other different uh, examples, such as we have a good example of the one of our companies is called New Post. Uh, that means that you can be somewhere here, you can uh, send, you can send something to the box, something even to the front line, and they will deliver this. And that works in Ukraine right now. It's like private, private initiative. You will send this today, and tomorrow someone near front line will get this. That's also a very good example. Thank you, because... Uh... I believe that we touch here uh, two uh, important things. With Artem, we just mentioned that, well, sometimes international partners have done things, have supported Ukraine in sometimes, uh, well, a less than coordinated manner. So there are some improvements. And at the same moment, with you, Alexandru, we realize that uh, there are personal, private initiatives that work. Turning to you, Stefan, Yourself, you have a personal experience of uh, supporting, also sponsoring, so uh, Ukrainian units through uh, crowdfunding, not happening in Ukraine, but happening here in France. Can you actually tell us more and how does uh, that refer to how uh, the war economy and the war effort can also be, if not supported, but at least maybe or almost subsidized from uh, from the outside, I won't say subsidized, but complementary. Um, so yes, I'm running a, a small uh, initiative to 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 support Ukrainian troops. Uh, as Guillaume said, I'm a reserve officer in the French Navy, and I wanted to to support my fellow Ukrainian uh, sailors uh, and Marines. And so, if you Google my my name and add uh, Ukraine Christmas, uh, you will find a page where you can donate, and we are providing uh, medical supplies to the Ukrainian Marine Brigade as well as a bit uh, of a French uh, Navy staple on the ships, which is pâté enough, uh, as you, perhaps some of you know. Um, and yes, this initiative is very important as many other ones, because we see that this conflict is really um, in our time, in a sense that it's one of the first conflicts where a nation state built with the welfare state is fighting for its survival. And what we see could be worrisome because um, Ukraine's domestic spending for defense is, is peaking in those days at much lower levels than, for example, French military spending in the First World War, basically around half um, the value that France was able to spend in the First World War. And we could say, oh, this is all because of social spending. But social spending means the value of human capital. And this is what Artem said. We need uh, the human capital capital to win this war. And so this is not a big deal if Ukraine is not able to directly spend through its state much of its uh, gross domestic product on war, because social spending helps the civil society first to sustain itself and second to sustain the war effort. And what we have seen is that liberal democracies are strong because they have both a strong state and strong civil societies. And what we see with the Russian war effort is that everything rests upon the state. And the Russian civil society is not really mobilized to sustain the war effort. But civil societies in Europe are supporting Ukraine's effort hand in hand with the uh, Ukrainian civil society. And this is really defining a new way to wage conflict in the long run. In the 20th century, almost, any, almost everything rested upon the state to build industrial mobilization, to uh, produce war gear, and to arms troops. And here we see that liberal democracies, because they have uh, a strong social spending, they are able to support that civil society. And so I, I think this is encouraging in the long run because we have been able for more than two years now, in spite of uh, inflation, in spite of rising prices throughout Europe, energy crisis, and a rising number of humanitarian uh, crises, we have been able to sustain this flow of humanitarian help for our uh, Ukrainian brothers. And this is really encouraging. And yes, you can Google my name and donate for the Ukrainian uh, uh, Marines uh, for Christmas. Thank you, uh, Stefan. <laughs> Thanks for the initiative. I believe it's more than just a uh, personal advertisement. Uh, moving on to you, Artem, for uh, the last uh, question prior to opening the floor to uh, the audience. Um, we just tackled the issue of human capital that you also mentioned. We also see here uh, an issue with regards to uh, how to protect the budget, 
uh, and uh, also the investment uh, in Ukraine for, uh, for the future. Uh, in a way, two sets of questions. What kind of solutions can be imagined? Uh, what are uh, the prospects uh, in doing so? Uh, is it reforming the banking system? Is it uh, doing something else? And second, uh, we might also tackle the issues of sanctions uh, versus Russia. And uh, maybe is, for instance, confiscating uh, Russian assets a possibility to help uh, maximize the reconstruction uh, issue? Uh, thank you, Guillaume. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll probably try and link uh, both questions uh, in, this, in this answer. And, um, and I'll start at the end with the, with the Russian assets and the Russian sanctions. Um, and again, uh, a bit of numbers for you. The, I've just quickly looked up um, the sales of Russian oil and gas for the first nine months of 2023 were in excess of 50 billion euros. Um, it's uh, <laughs> at the same time the needs of uh, Ukrainian budget uh, for the sorry the deficit of the Ukrainian budget for next year is about 40 billion euros. And this are this is the money that uh, Stefan and the colleagues and all of us essentially are collecting for to support the humanitarian efforts to support the military needs. So we have to use our own resources because there's not enough money in the budget to do that. And at the same time, the world continues to pay Russia for its supplies. Um, look, it's not it's not it's not a moral discussion, right? We we probably all agree that it's morally wrong. Um, but I just uh, look the title of this of this panel is economic war, and it's it's a wide open question whether the sanctions work. Uh, many in this room probably claim that they do if you look at the changes in the Russian economy. But at the same time, uh, they don't because the world is different. The world is globalized. The trade is globalized. We are we are seeing at EBRD. We're looking at. Uh, what our economists very modestly call changing trade patterns, where you see Turkey, Central Asia, and Caucasus uh, doubling and tripling their exports uh, into uh, Russia uh, in the space of uh, less than two years. Th that's not happening. This is essentially Russian imports from the West. Um, something has to be done there if we are serious about winning this war. We cannot rely solely on the Ukrainian economy and some key international donors to support that effort. So we must use sanctions again against Russia in a much more dramatic way. Um, this is on the sanctions front. There is also, of course, the issue with the Russian assets that are there in the West. There are different numbers, but kind of a consensus number that we're looking about 300 billion uh, euros of uh, Russian assets, mostly Russian central bank assets that are there in mostly in Europe. Uh, it's a very tough question. It's never been done before. The, the confiscation is, uh, is, a, is a taboo word. Uh, nobody wants to touch that because of the uh, private property rights and uh, the future use by the future Russian generations under democratic rule and whatnot. Um, Look, I, I'm not a lawyer, I won't dwell on that, but I just I struggle to see why a port of Russian assets controlled and owned by the Russian government would not be used to essentially ensure or cover the risks of Russian missiles exploding and destroying assets of Ukrainian or foreign businesses in Ukraine. It just makes no sense us Again, scrapping the uh, bottom of the barrel, trying to find money to buy more drones for Ukraine, where there are hundreds of billions of assets sitting in the bank accounts in Europe. Thank you, Artem, with this uh, very interesting uh, saying. Now we move on to, uh, to the floor and to the audience. And uh, prior to uh, moving so, because as we will uh, slowly move on to uh, the lunch break, I have the pleasure, for those who are actually willing to, to invite you, uh, all of you, 
uh, to the lunch break that will happen in 10 to 15 minutes, just after the, the question and answers, at Pavillon Jove. So please uh, bear with us if you want to be uh, well willing to, to share this uh, moment of uh, uh, discussion also with the various experts. Um, who wants to actually start? But first, please, sir. Yeah, wait for the mic. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, a quick and short uh, question for one reason that uh, just to give the possibility to, uh, to, to provide answers. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, will be short. Uh, Gandhi Maksak, Ukrainian Prism, uh, Think Tank in Ukraine. I have short questions, but for all three speakers. Uh, the first one goes to uh, Stefan. Appreciation for your personal attachment to Ukraine. Thank it you. Is, it is needed in Ukraine. Thank you. And question uh, from position of NATO and EU partners. What can be done maybe to secure this humanitarian corridor which is created nowadays in Black Sea? Next question to Alexander. Uh, you mentioned that we have edge at the moment with sea drones, but with more and more uh, entering attrition war, Russia can catch up with, with their own drones on sea, and uh, that's why to just regain dominance. What is your answer to that? What should we do to jointly with our partners? And to Artem, uh, I think that for reconstruction, it is pivotal to have uh, private investments in Ukraine. How we can not secure, but maybe to encourage this process. Thank you. Please, just one minute uh, per person, if that's a uh, possibility. Uh, Artem, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Uh, it's, it's actually, again, we, because of the deficit of time, I, I didn't dwell on all of my notes. Yes, private sector is absolutely essential. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. Um, when the new EU, U.S. representative uh, for Ukrainian reconstruction, Penny Pritzker, was in Ukraine earlier this year, she was essentially saying, look, that, that's where you have to go. You, you must use 2024 to make sure that private sector steps in. Uh, war risk. <laughs> war risk is the biggest uh, detriment. It's, uh, uh, it's an open question. Uh, many stakeholders are trying to develop war risk insurance solutions. Um, unfortunately, the size of the task is way too big. The usual suspects who should have stepped in, like MIGA, uh, failed to do that. Well, I stand corrected. They tried to do that, but uh, doing a, I think, 11 million euro project is not a serious response to a war of that kind. Uh, those uh, confiscated assets or frozen assets could be a solution to use them as a, as, as a uh, pool of uh, liquidity to kind of backstop these risks. But um, yeah, war risk insurance is the biggest uh, bottleneck in uh, private sector insurance, private sector insurance, uh, private sector investment. Okay, let's now shift to uh, Stefan, mm -hmm. because uh, addressing those more strategic and uh, international issues prior to moving to the tactical uh, response by uh, Alexander. So what can we do as partners uh, to, to secure the, the Ukrainian access to, to the Black Sea? Um, first of all, I, I agree that one answer, one simple and easy answer, is to provide uh, state sponsors mechanisms for maritime insurance, uh, possibly back it with Russian assets. This is really a good idea. I mean, this is just collateral for, for a guarantee. Second, from a military point of view, I think that most of the question lies in our relations with Turkey and the way Turkey handles uh, the Straits in the Dardanelles. Because we have let President Erdogan have a very, very um, particular interpretation of the Montreux Convention, allowing Turkey to close the straits if it feels itself threatened. But if, it, if Turkey feels itself threatened, why not invoking Article 5 of NATO? What could NATO do is to provide freedom of navigation operations in international waters in the Black Sea. Because there's nothing that we can do directly in Ukrainian territorial waters. But this is also a subject of common maritime space. And, and we have been consistent in, uh, over the years to provide freedom of navigation operations in common maritime spaces in Asia, in the Taiwan Straits. And we are not doing this in the international waters of Black Sea. And I think that perhaps we should because it would place Russia with a real dilemma whether or not to accept to shoot at international ships and NATO ships in the international waters. And I bet the Russians would not do that. So I think it could be done if we have the will to do so. And it would really help the Ukrainians to secure their access to the Black Sea. 
Alexander, uh, on the drones and uh, maybe the, the, the question of local superiority or yeah. not? Yeah, I just uh, want to add that uh, uh, at least I remember one. Uh, it was in 2021 when a British naval yep. ship Defender was in, the, uh, in Ukrainian territorial water near Crimea, near Sevastopol. So that example shows that NATO countries could do something if they want. Yes. Uh, so uh, when we are talking about the drones, uh, of course, we need to understand that Russians will try to produce and manufacture their own. And we understand this in Ukraine. Uh, and what we want to try to do in this, we just want, we need to be first and better. We began this operation first and we need to stay first. How we can do this? Uh, answer is simple, because uh, I can see that we need to work in the uh, upgrading our system, because drones, it's, uh, you know, it's always upgrading, 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 new soft, new technologies, and just to be better. And I think that if we will have Western supporters, if we will have support in from uh, Britain, United States, France, it could be better, and, and, we will, and we will still be first in this. Thank you. So, uh, uh, okay, one question, one question, and then... Uh, 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 wait a minute for please, uh, you, as you've been registered. This is for the banker, Tiam. Uh, bankers love to make projections. I know you've made them. What's your projection on the ultimate cost to Ukraine and USD for beating Russia, reclaiming eastern Ukraine, and taking Crimea, and briefly address the relationship or correlation between the expenditure of Ukrainian money, which it doesn't have right now, and Ukrainian blood? A minute, and then, please, uh, no, sir. That, that, that's, that's not a minute long. Uh, <laughs> and, and, well, just uh, prior, yeah, please uh, ask your question also. No, no, you, you sir. Yeah. No, you. Sir, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, again, Jean-Louis Merny, Ecole Polytechnique. Um, about the will to uh, um, uh, fight this economic war, how efficient is the embargo on Russian export and import. Uh, you, you've seen German exports to Kyrgyzstan have been <coughs> multiplied by 10, more or less multiplied by two to a number of others, uh, former uh, USSR republics. And you know, we all know where these goods are ending. Uh, so what can we do uh, to improve the efficacy of this embargo? Thank you. Two, uh, I, I believe, two questions to basically add, maybe also actually to the old panelists. I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to answer very briefly the second one. Look, I, I wish I had uh, an, an easy solution. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, the, it's a very globalized trade uh, environment we, we live in, but there are ways to do that. I mean, look, uh, Iranian sanctions were not ideal, but they were in incredibly more successful than sanctions against Russia. Sanctions against Russia by design are weak. I mean, I, I don't want to point any fingers, but I think it's about a coherent effort from the key capitals. We, we can have a situation where the, the, the leaders, where uh, Scholz and Macron and, and, and Sunak or whoever go out and say one thing, and then their businesses come uh, behind the closed doors and lobby for uh, waivers <coughs> and, and exceptions, um, and then goods continue to flow. So if, if it is a sanction, it is a sanction. It's not, it cannot be a gray area. Um, on, the, on, on, on your questions, look, A, there are, there's no, I don't think anyone has done a projection like that, because what you are asking is a number that includes everything. And, uh, I, I can only say that various estimates of the true cost of rebuilding Ukrainian economy post-war, I've heard numbers 500 billion, 750 trillion, um, but th this is all, um, it's a process. It'll take a decade and it will require a lot of private sector investment. So that's more or less a natural process rather than someone writing all those checks. And as I said, if you look at this within the big scheme of things, a uh, global economy is not a huge cost to a major, major 
element of security and resilience to the global economy. Look, it's, and this is something that was mentioned at the, uh, at the beginning, when the war in Ukraine is not seen as a global war. I think this is the biggest fallacy of, of this conflict. Mm -hmm. It is a global war. Russia made it a global war, and it started even, even before 2014. Uh, the world looked in the opposite direction in 2014. The world tried to uh, get it on the cheap <coughs> since 22. Um, the cost to the world and to the global economy of not supporting Ukrainian victory will be absolutely critical. Because essentially, if Russia is not defeated in Ukraine, your military budgets will go up tremendously. This money will not be spent on healthcare, on education, on climate change. Forget support to Ukraine. Even these three components basically will mean that the, the, the kids in the West, in the collective West, will be less well off simply because Russia was not defeated in Ukraine. And it's, it's a brutal truth that now the only blood that is being paid for that is the Ukrainian blood. Well, that's a, a very interesting uh, remark. And thank you, Artem, for this, uh, for this, uh, for this remark. Please, Alexander and, and Stefan, if you want actually to, yeah. to jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, a few words about uh, export control and the sanctions. I agree with Artem when, when he says that if we don't pay the price of this conflict, no, it will cost us much more later. And the good side is we have all the levers in Europe, in the European institutions, to address that. We might think that Europe is built upon the free trade, a free open market, and so we can't stop exports uh, to Uzbekistan or to Central Asia. Yes, we can. We have some export control mechanisms uh, in place on dual use goods and uh, weapons of war, and we can extend those mechanisms to critical uh, supplies that are sent to uh, uh, Central Asia. And uh, the Europeans have been creative with their institutions in the past, and we have been able to say we will do whatever it takes. We have done whatever it took to save the euro when, when we had the euro crisis. We did whatever it took to uh, endure the pandemic and to pay for our corporations during the pandemic. So the very day the Europeans will be able to say we will do whatever it takes to win this conflict, this very day Putin will understand that he will not be able to win and perhaps he will think of withdrawing. On this... Uh I wouldn't even say this happy note, but these uh, very interesting uh, remarks. Uh, let me offer actually two things. First, uh, we'll now close uh, the session, and I want to literally thank uh, these uh, speakers and the panelists for uh, being with me. So please uh, help me by thanking them. And uh, we will now move on for those who want uh, towards Pavillon Joffre. Uh, please follow uh, the various people that know where it is. Uh, we will reconvene at 2 uh, p.m. for uh, the rest of the day and uh, take uh, this opportunity to engage also with the various speakers and panelists. I bet uh, we have uh, all the time. Um, Anastasia, please. We can move on. Merci beaucoup. Merci à toi. Merci. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that it's more just a question of economy. Can I just make a short photo of you here? You can direct that.